It wasn't always like this. Libya once had one of the highest standards of living in Africa. Now the anthem of the Jamaharia echoes in the ruins like a ghost. This is a story told from the ruins. Today at Tripoli Airport, he welcomes his friend President Said Barre of Somalia. Both are fanatics, but Gaddafi's coup was bloodless. He has no taste for violence at home. He prefers to export the bloody libation of fanaticism. On a l'impression qu'il a été suffisamment blessé pour rétorquer, pour rétorquer que, eh bien oui, eh bien oui, je suis excentrique, je suis fou, je suis pas comme vous. Despite our repeated warnings, Gaddafi continued his reckless policy of intimidation, his relentless pursuit of terror. He counted on America to be passive. He counted wrong. One of the mistakes which some political analysts make is to think that their enemies should be our enemies. Hi, good morning. We are in front of the Libyan mission. You can see it right there. It's that tented entrance. That is where Muammar Gaddafi spent the night last night after a running drama over where this international pariah should be allowed to sleep. When things got too intense, Gaddafi would retreat to the desert near his home. Here he grew up herding camels and goats with his father. Here he would pray, meditate, and be silent. Amongst the Bedouin, Gaddafi grounded his values and ideology, universal truths of God and man. Out of the desert came the third internationalist theory, which guided Libya through decades of his rule. In the desert was the true Islam, freed from confusion created by urban clerics. Like every aspect of his rule, Gaddafi's retreat was mythologized. Postcards in Tripoli showed his divine desert inspiration. But even in the Sahara, Gaddafi was rarely without his shortwave radio. He liked to tune into the BBC and hear reports about himself. At the start of the Libyan civil war, he was an almost constant topic. BBC World Have Your Say broadcast heated debates. Libyan civilians called in and reported on the chaos. One night, a man claiming to be Gaddafi's son was invited on air. He unleashed a string of English profanities which the BBC broadcast live across the world. Many Africans got involved, praising Gaddafi and complaining about biased media. In the early days of the war, Gaddafi looked the likely winner. It's possible he tuned into these debates from his desert tent, casting his eyes downward and smiling quietly, as was his custom. The man at the heart of an international storm. Vilified by the West, Gaddafi is something of a pan-African icon, not just because of years of diplomacy on the continent, but also because of the manner of his destruction. Flickering between monster and martyr, his ghost haunts Africa. This is the story of Muammar Gaddafi's rise and fall. Muammar Gaddafi was born the youngest child in a family of three sisters. His father was a member of the Qadhazfa tribe who lived in the region around Sirte. Gaddafi's exact birth date is uncertain, but it was probably in the early 1940s. The Allies and Axis fought each other across the Libyan desert. After the Second World War ended, Britain and France divided Libya between themselves. It was only in 1951 that the UN voted to create an independent country, the United Kingdom of Libya, with King Idris as leader. As a young boy, Gaddafi walked 30 kilometers to school in Sirte each week. His father prioritized education and paid for as much schooling as a rural camel herder could afford. Gaddafi slept in a local mosque on weekdays and worked hard at his studies. He developed an interest in history and politics. 
To help with his education, his family moved to the town of Sabha, where Gaddafi attended secondary school. Here, he made lifelong friends, like Ab es Salam Jalud. It was also here he had his first exposure to pan-Arab ideology. Egyptian teachers shared newspapers and played radio broadcasts. The Egyptian leader, Abdel Nasser, became Gaddafi's personal hero. He watched as Nasser launched a revolution in 1952, toppling the monarchy. Then came the Suez Crisis and Nasser's decision to oppose Europe and Israel. In 1961, Gaddafi took part in demonstrations against the monarchy. His family were expelled from Sabha for misbehavior. After that experience, Gaddafi refused to join any political parties. Instead, like at many points in his life, he turned inwards for a time before emerging with a new focus. During this first inward turn, Gaddafi read voraciously. He became an expert on the French Revolution and the life of Sun Yat-sen. He also found a role model in Abraham Lincoln. These were the underdogs who had changed the world. Gaddafi's reading led him to pursue a degree in history. But soon enough, his focus shifted away. Gaddafi dropped out of his degree to join the army. Nasser had led his coup with a group of loyal officers, and Gaddafi envisioned he would do the same. With friends from home like Jaloud, Gaddafi formed the Free Officers Movement. The group organized into cells to prevent exposure in case one member was discovered. Gaddafi quietly traveled across the Sirte region, collecting Qadhaz for supporters. His careful planning and low profile meant state intelligence took little interest in his actions. Gaddafi developed lifelong patterns of behavior. What was said directly, what was organized openly, these things were rarely at the heart of the matter. By 1969, the situation in Libya was tense. King Idris's pro-Western foreign policy was resented. Libyans saw European companies benefit from newfound oil. Corruption was rife. Tribes like the Qadhafa opposed state centralization. Protests broke out in Tripoli and Benghazi. Rumors circulated that the deputy commander of the army was going to launch a coup. Backed by Britain, Abdul Salhi's black boots were poised to take over. For Muammar Gaddafi, decades of planning boiled down into a single decision. It was now or never. Whilst the king was away on holiday, Gaddafi preempted the Salhi group, rapidly launching his own free officers coup. The code word, Jerusalem. The coup was extremely well planned and largely unexpected. The free officers occupied airports, police stations and government offices. The two main army bases were secured. His friend Jaloud took control of the anti-aircraft batteries in Tripoli. The crown prince was captured and forced to relinquish the throne. No serious fighting took place. It was a white revolution. Minutes before a radio address to the nation, Gaddafi scrawled a quick speech. It's eloquence testament to long hours fantasizing about this moment. You sons of the Bedouin, sons of the desert and our ancient cities, of our green countryside and beloved villages onwards, for we have work to do and the hour has come. Gaddafi told Libyans the military coup was in fact a revolution of the people. This was the creation of a Libyan Arab Republic. Corruption was over. Justice and equality for all. Gaddafi was chairman of the Revolutionary Council, leader of the 12 officers who had led the coup. He took direct control of the army. Jaloud was appointed prime minister. A series of counter coups followed, but Gaddafi survived. Political parties remained banned. The council turned their attention to the economy. Oil prices were increased and better deals made with foreign companies. Gradually, the government bought majority shares in all refineries. As a consequence, GDP rose from 4 billion in 1969 
to 14 billion in 1974. Profits were used to fund a green revolution, a series of irrigation projects designed to increase the nation's food production. Much of the land was seized from Italian settlers. Libyans saw the minimum wage double and jobs in education and business open to women. Everything was in Arabic. The new Libya made waves in its foreign policy. Gaddafi finally met his idol as a fellow leader on the world stage. Initially, he struggled to contain his enthusiasm. Nasser later reflecting, he is a nice boy, but very naive. Plans to create a pan-Arab union moved quickly. Egypt, Sudan and Libya formed a revolutionary front, designed as a first step to eventual union. Syria announced its intentions to join, but in 1970 Nasser died, and the pan-Arab union faded into the background, much to Gaddafi's frustration. Following in Nasser's footsteps, Gaddafi's attitude to Europe and America was confrontational. The American military base in Libya was closed. Gaddafi saw Malta as his sphere of influence, pressuring the Maltese government to remove its NATO airbase. To assert itself in the Mediterranean, Libya bought weapons from France and the USSR. But Gaddafi quickly earned himself a black name in the Western press. Colonial stereotypes were deployed. Gaddafi was a mad Mahdi, a fanatic, and had delusions of grandeur. The character assassination affected him. He loved to be loved. He spent the rest of his life indulging and obstructing these Western narratives. There was good reason for the aggressive line. Libya was funding militant organizations around the world. The Irish Republican Army, the Black Panther Party, the African National Congress. Staunchly anti-Israel, Gaddafi supported a wide range of Palestinian militant groups, including the Black September Organization. Already, the two images of Gaddafi had begun to emerge, a deadly threat to Western stability and a powerful ally in the struggle for liberation. But not all was well in Libya. Rumours of coups and reshuffles abounded. In 1971, Gaddafi resigned before returning to his role a month later. In 1972, many of the free officers were removed from government and replaced with experienced officials. Gaddafi kept Jaloud by his side. In 1973, he resigned twice in two months. The changes were building to something, but no one knew what. Gaddafi's repeated outbursts and resignations frustrated the Revolutionary Council. In April 1973, he agreed to announce his final resignation in a speech in Zawara. To everyone's surprise, he instead announced the start of a popular revolution. Each village would generate a general people's committee to protect the revolution. It's difficult to say how much planning went into Gaddafi's Zawara speech. It may have been written just before he went on stage, like his 1969 radio broadcast. For outside commentators, it looked like something borrowed from Mao's China. The new structures increased participation in government, but power was now concentrated in Gaddafi's hands. From the cusp of resignation, he had become unassailable. The popular revolution was accompanied by a cult of personality. Out of the desert came divine inspiration, the third internationalist theory. People needed to remind themselves of the original God-given order. Neither Western democracy nor communism were the answer. Instead, true freedom came through direct democracy of general people's committees. Gaddafi's ideas were published in the Green Book, which was distributed across Libya and around the world. It was written in simple, easily understandable language. Students in Libyan high schools studied it in their classes. Gaddafi's comfort zone was to be one step above the structures of government. His ability to perform for others and build secret alliances had allowed him to lead a successful coup. But his approach to running a country was surprisingly similar. True power, for Gaddafi, was almost always covert. 
an approach which worried the remaining members of the Revolutionary Council. In 1975, they launched a failed coup. When some fled to Egypt, Gaddafi sent hired mercenaries to wipe out the stray dogs. The formal rules of state diplomacy were simply a game. Libyan diplomats were known to be spies and assassins. Gaddafi's deep distrust of foreign embassies sprung from his own misuse of diplomatic staff. His paranoid fear of Libyan exiles abroad came from his own knowledge of the damage he would do as a political exile. Libya's footprint in Africa was already a mixed one. In the 1970s, half a billion dollars flowed into infrastructure and development projects south of the Sahara. At the same time, Gaddafi funded a chaotic insurgency war in Chad. Just as Egypt had influence over Sudan, so Gaddafi wanted to control Chad. Libyan troops occupied the uranium-rich Auzu Strip. The Chadian war was a strategic component of Libya's small nuclear program. Gaddafi's ambitious foreign policy was accompanied by ambitions at home. After the failed coup, the Revolutionary Council was on its last legs. In 1977, Gaddafi pushed it over, replacing it with something new. The days of the Republic were over. Now came the days of the Jamahiriya, literally the mass state. The Green Revolution had a green flag. The Revolutionary Council was out. The General People's Committees were in, and Gaddafi himself was retiring, resigning to the position of brotherly guide. The people were in charge. Committees did have some power. Following the guidance of the Green Book, they nationalized more businesses. In general, they agreed to most things Gaddafi proposed. The new Jamahiriya needed an army to match. Gaddafi created the Islamic Legion of Africans. Alongside the Islamic Legion was the true Islam. For a long time, Gaddafi had worried Islamic clerics with his forays into the religious sphere. He sometimes dressed as an imam and led Friday prayers. The Jamahiriya was a fulfillment of prophecy. The revolution came from within. He loved to quote Surah 1311. Allah does not change a people's lot unless they change what is in their hearts. Islamist groups quickly moved to oppose the Jamahiriya. They were met by the Green Terror, revolutionary justice administered by the people with little law or oversight. Just as Gaddafi was the most authentic Muslim, so he was also the most enlightened Arab feminist. On a rare occasion, Gaddafi and the General People's Committees found themselves in disagreement. The people opposed women joining the armed forces, but the brotherly guide knew better. The revolutionary nuns would become Gaddafi's most loyal bodyguards. The green state turned the deserts green. The great man-made river project pumped water trapped under the desert and sent it to cities and farms. 3,000 kilometers of pipes supplied 70% of Libya's water. For Gaddafi, it was the eighth wonder of the world. But the Jamahiriya became most famous for its conflict with the USA. America categorized Libya as a sponsor of terror for its funding of militant groups. In Libya, Gaddafi hired ex-CIA officers to advise him. The Americans jailed them for collaboration. Meanwhile, Gaddafi had a young Libyan who was studying in America, publicly executed after he led a protest. Neither Reagan nor Gaddafi were willing to back down. After a bomb exploded in a Berlin disco, Reagan blamed Gaddafi. The source of the attack is still debated. Nevertheless, Reagan saw an opportunity to retaliate. The USA bombed military bases and Gaddafi's home in Libya. Gaddafi claimed his daughter Hannah had died in the attack. Libyan postcards captured the sense of victimhood and injustice. Despite funding militant organizations around the world, Gaddafi deeply resented the direct aggression meted out by America. 
he left for the deserts of Surt and meditated. Staring up at wild desert stars, American planes would not blot out. Reagan's final aggression came through Chad, where American and French funding forced Libya into a humiliating retreat. The uranium of the Auzu Strip was now beyond Gaddafi's grasp. The late 80s and early 90s saw Gaddafi trying to recover from the American conflict. A drop in the price of oil created unrest. Very gradually, the economy was liberalized. Businesses and entrepreneurs were encouraged. Hundreds of political prisoners were freed. The Great Green Charter of Human Rights was adopted. Worried about the loyalty of the General People's Committees, Gaddafi created a secondary state structure. Revolutionary committees, which were designed to be totally loyal to the nation's guide. In 1988, a passenger airliner blew up over Scotland. In the Western press, the Lockerbie bombing was viewed as a retaliation for Reagan's bombing. When Libya refused to hand over two men accused by the British police, the UN issued sanctions against the country. Decades of funding liberation groups eventually paid off in 1989, when Mandela was freed from prison in South Africa. Despite criticism from the West, Mandela embraced this long-term funder of the African National Congress. The first al-Gaddafi Prize for Human Rights was awarded to him. Like many African leaders, Mandela criticized the UN sanctions on a visit to Libya, the South Africa connection was the start of a late Pan-African spring in the Gaddafi government. The collapse of the Soviet Union forced Gaddafi's foreign policy in new directions. The invasion of Iraq terrified him. Libya announced the end of its nuclear and chemical weapons programs. On the Israel-Palestine issue, his opinions also changed. The answer for Gaddafi was a single-state solution. Gaddafi's outspokenness became legendary. As the longest-serving Arab head of state, he felt he had earned the right to speak his mind. In reality, this earned him many enemies. He often lambasted Gulf state royals for doing deals with America and not forming a united bloc. In his own relations with America, he worked hard to present himself as an alternative to extremism. In 2008, Libya paid $1.5 billion into a fund to compensate victims of the Lockerbie bombing and the 1986 US bombings in Libya. Gaddafi could afford it because he had agreed a $5 billion compensation package with Italian Prime Minister Berlusconi the same year. In exchange, Libya had agreed to put aside the misdeeds of Italy's colonial past. The two countries would work together to limit illegal migration to Europe. Changing relationships in East and West were accompanied by a new pan-Africanist drive. We want an African military to defend Africa. We want a single currency. We want one African passport. Libya funded hospitals and stadiums across the continent giving Gaddafi a very positive image south of the Sahara. In 2008, Gaddafi had himself proclaimed King of Kings by a group of tribal leaders in Ethiopia. At the same time, he apologized to members of the African Union for his ancestors' part in the Arab slave trade. Bridging the North-South cultural divide with a story of shared oppression, he told a large crowd in Guinea, Coca-Cola and Pepsi are African made. The popular drink was a symbol of how Western companies extract Africa's raw resources and then resell expensive products to the African consumer. Within Libya, select parts of the government were privatized. Politically, Gaddafi remained untouchable. However, glimmers of change came from Saif al Islam Gaddafi, favorite son of the Brotherly Guide. He criticized the country's human rights record and proposed a new constitution. In 2008, he created a private media company which directed moderate criticism at the government. 
the liberal leanings of Gaddafi's son provide a glimpse of an alternative history, one where Gaddafi dies peacefully and a more ordered transition, sees his son take power, like the liberalizing reforms of Muhammad VI in Morocco. The narrative around Muammar Gaddafi's demise is highly contested. The Western press unquestionably accepted the anti-Gaddafi narrative. Africans who supported Gaddafi seemed like a bizarre oddity. In fact, the collapse of the Jamaharia was only made possible by NATO's intervention. In the 2000s, Gaddafi claimed to fund several French politicians, including Nicolas Sarkozy. Perhaps he hoped this would soften the consequences of his foray into West Africa. Traditionally, the region is seen as France's sphere of influence. Many nations use a shared currency. In the 2000s, this was known as the CFA. 50% of the reserve currency was held in French banks. Notes were printed in France, and the currency's value pegged to the euro. But Gaddafi wanted Africa to make its own Coca-Cola. Leaked emails from Hillary Clinton show an American perspective on the situation. Gaddafi's government holds 143 tons of gold and a similar amount of silver, intended to be used to establish a pan-African currency based on the Libyan gold dinar. This plan was designed to provide the Francophone African countries with an alternative to the French franc. Gaddafi had made himself an immediate threat to France's interests in Africa. Protests and opposition to Gaddafi's rule had a long history, but mass demonstrations were triggered by the Arab Spring. The government lowered food prices and released Islamist prisoners, but security forces also fired on protesters. France led the drive to enforce a no-fly zone. Gaddafi's brief rapprochement with the West proved of little worth. From an early stage, rebels were supported by Western governments, Qatari special forces took part in key battles and trained battalions. NATO drone strikes hit civilian and military targets. The humanitarian military intervention swung the war decisively in favor of the rebels. State TV broadcast its final reruns, showing a Libyan past that had suddenly become unrecognizable. A land of brightly lit buildings and clean streets. War crimes were conducted on both sides in a brutal conflict which destroyed large swathes of Libyan cities. Gaddafi refused to resign. Several of his children had died in drone strikes. He would be a martyr before he gave up Libya. He moved from house to house, avoiding drone strikes, reading the Quran and praying. Gradually, his forces were driven back to his loyalist homeland, back to the desert a final time. In Sirte, he made a final call to his wife and daughters. He was a martyr for Libya and Africa. Be proud of me, be proud of me, be proud of me, he repeated feverishly. The next day, he and his bodyguards broke through the encircling rebels and headed towards a valley. A performer to the last, he envisaged a final stand in the desert. But before they reached the site, NATO bombed the convoy forcing Gaddafi and his remaining soldiers into irrigation pipes for cover. Dazed and bloodied from a grenade, the man who oversaw the great man-made river project was dragged out of the pipes by a crowd of rebel soldiers. Why are you doing this? asked the martyr. At some point in the ensuing chaos, he died. Hillary Clinton had just arrived in Libya on a victory lap. As we came, we saw, he died. <laughs> she told the American media, echoing the words of Libya's Roman invaders. The CIA famously claimed Gaddafi had borderline personality disorder. Others suggest he was a narcissist. What is clear is that Gaddafi surrounded himself with beautiful and noble values, Below the surface was brutal covert aggression and public threats. He moved easily from the role of oppressor to victim, from monster to martyr. Working with Gaddafi could be a nightmare, 
Abdes Salam al-Jaloud had the longest run. He was in government from 1969 to the 1990s, when the two finally fell out. Jaloud turned against Gaddafi in the end, calling his former friend's death the natural end of any tyrant. Although he was charming in person, Gaddafi often struggled to maintain long-term close relationships with others. Invariably, his outbursts and covert boundary crossing frustrated his acquaintances. This seemed to be less true with women. Gaddafi grew up the youngest with three sisters. He surrounded himself with Ukrainian nurses and revolutionary nuns. After his death, many reflected fondly on their time with him. In government, Gaddafi repeatedly introduced new systems. Every ten years, a fresh revolution. But much political power remained undefined, resting ambiguously in his lap. In Libya, this created a governance void after his death. What is extraordinary is how much he achieved with this system of power. In 1969, Libyans were largely illiterate. The country had a high infant mortality rate. Most food was imported. The nation exported scrap metal from German tanks. Under Gaddafi, the masses were educated, the country increased its food production, and made healthcare available to all. Massive infrastructure projects provided power and water. The same projects now crumble from a decade of neglect. Gaddafi found strength in playing a role, a younger Nasser, a true Imam, an enlightened guide, an African king. For Western governments, his final performance was his most dangerous, the persecuted martyr. A year after his demise, Sasha Baron Cohen released his film, The Dictator. Why? Why The Dictator? Why The Dictator? Well, I had always found Colonel Gaddafi hilarious. Hollywood made a character assassination disguised as a comedy movie. You don't laugh at a martyr, right? But ruthless, charismatic leaders are best disposed of by natural causes. Gaddafi has quietly entered the pan-African pantheon. Alongside men like Patrice Lumumba and Thomas Sankara, he holds a privileged place. He is iconic not just by his actions, but by the manner of his destruction. And the longer Libya remains in chaos, the brighter the days of the Jamaharia appear. Now, in the sands south of Sirt, Islamist extremists trickle out of the failed Libyan state into Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso. Now, West Africans who still use the French CFA travel across the desert in the opposite direction. In Libya, they find gangs who will take them across the Mediterranean to the Promised Land. There is blood in the desert where Gaddafi dreamed, and it's not just his own. If you enjoyed this content and would like more, please subscribe to The Africa Review on YouTube.